Hi, this is part one of a three part lecture series on spinal cord injury rehabilitation. If you are an undergraduate physiotherapy student, I think you might find it useful. In the first part, we will be discussing about an overview of pathogenesis of spinal cord injury, especially I'll be focusing on traumatic spinal cord injury, but the features uh, or the content would be more or less applicable to other types of spinal cord disorders too. And in addition to spinal pathogenesis, I will also briefly cover the clinical features. The purpose of this first part is to give an overview of uh, what happens when there is an injury inside the spinal cord, what are all the uh, physiological process, that is pathophysiological process uh, that takes place, and how that knowledge might help us understanding uh, the clinical features and uh, also the uh, initial medical treatment that a patient should receive. Spinal cord injury, the traumatic spinal cord injury, the most common causes are uh, traffic accidents, gunshot injuries, knife injuries, falls, and sports in injuries. In Indian context, the traffic accidents and falls are the most common types of uh, common causes of sp traumatic spinal cord injury. Uh, and this is a is traumatic spinal cord injury is very commonly seen in uh, young adults. That is the age group of uh, from 18 to 35. Very common because of uh, high risk behavior and uh, you know, the traffic accident. It's, it's, uh, very common in uh, young adults. And also that's why spinal cord injury can be a very devastating to uh, a patient's life because they are uh, most of them very young individuals and they got spinal cord injury and they have to live with it for the rest of their life. Another common reason is falls, uh, uh, if, especially in rural region, if you, you, quite a lot of people fall from a height, uh, commonly we see uh, uh, either uh, fall from a tree or they're working in a construction site and these are all common reasons that we see in, in patients with a spinal cord injury. So what happens when there is an injury, right? That's an important aspect. Uh, understanding it, I think it's critical for physiotherapists to understand uh, the pathogenesis. In pathogenesis, the uh, often in textbooks or in, in common teaching also, the primary focus is on uh, the, the direct injury, the impact of direct injury, the fracture and how the impacted, uh, I mean, a fractured vertebral segment or impinging on uh, uh, spinal cord, right? But a lot of recent research suggests that uh, in addition to direct injury, the indirect injury or what is known as secondary injury, which is due to uh, inflammation reaction following injury seems to have uh, a, a major impact on the disability or the severity of injury that is caused. So uh, we need to, uh, so we need to understand uh, what, how exactly this happens. This, this gives us a, a really a good picture of how spinal cord injury leads to, uh, leads to uh, damage of nerve tissues. You can see in this uh, picture, you can see here the normal uh, spinal cord, there's a mechanical impact. You know, it can be a fall from, injur uh, fall from a height or a, a traffic, in uh, traffic injury, right? So what happens here, the, as a, due to primary injury is uh, directly due to the impact. You know, it's a fractured segment that is impinging on the uh, spinal cord. And the damage caused by a, a direct injury is often, in many cases, it, it may not be as severe, but if the damage caused is left uh, unaddressed, that is immediate medical care is not given, the secondary injury often seems to have a major impact. That is what the secondary injury, what I mean by the inflammatory reactions, which causes uh, inter intraparenchymal hemorrhage, a disruption of the blood brains, uh, blood spinal cord barrier, 
and and also the the swelling that is uh, resulting from the damage if this uh, hemorrhage and swelling often uh, uh, pressing on the neighboring nerve tissue which causes further damage right so if the patient is immediately hospitalized and if the medical care is given to reduce the inflammatory impact and uh, a, a significant amount of damage can be minimized or prevented. So that's why understanding pathogenesis, uh, especially about the pathogenesis of the secondary uh, events are critical. Uh, it may not be, uh, from the physiotherapist may not have direct role in it, but it's, it's uh, important for us to understand how the damage uh, actually takes place. And corticosteroids, which is if it's given uh, immediately after injury, seems to have, uh, we have good evidence to suggest that have a, a considerable impact on reducing the damage caused by secondary lesion. Uh, let us go a little bit uh, into the, little bit in depth into the pathogenesis, into exactly how the events unfold. So when there is a lesion, this is an illustration of the spinal cord. Of course, this is for simplicity. We have a few neurons or axons were shown, but you just multiply by probably thousands and hundreds of thousands or even millions of axons. So if you have a, have a look at here, the first uh, neuron, uh, the axon, if you see, this is what a normal axon would look like. You have a myelin sheet, uh, uh, it's in there, and you can also see the outer layer over here. So when a damage occurs, what happens is you have myelin sheet torn over here. The axon still remains in some cases, and uh, in some, neuro some axons, the axons are cut. So there is discontinuity between uh, uh, different parts of the axon, right? And which is after that, there is an immune response is there, body's uh, repair process, which leads to gliosis. You have astrocytes that comes into, you know, repair, which causes gliosis, cavitation, and so on and so forth, which eventually makes, uh, it, it tries to help uh, uh, protect the damaged part, uh, damaged system. But at the same time, unlike other tissues such as skin uh, 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 or skin or even soft tissues, the repair process uh, often uh, doesn't really replace the original tissue or produce a newer tissue here. Uh, so the spinal cord, when it is damaged, it is often left more or less like this. Technically speaking, axon can regrow, but in, in most cases that regrowth is often insignificant in terms of clinical uh, recovery. So the damage is often determined in terms of how much of the axons that are left if it's an incomplete injury, right? And uh, this process, we need to, uh, having an understanding of this process can help us to uh, have a, a better understanding of recovery that follows. Now, uh, the clinical features when it comes from the pathogenesis, as you can see, if, uh, it, if it's complete, there is broad classification for spinal cord injury, it's complete and incomplete injury. That is, as we have seen in the previous picture in here, this depicts uh, incomplete spinal cord injury and, and also uh, it's broadly uh, a severe uh, damage, as you can see. And in some, uh, in some cases, there may be complete uh, cut, uh, complete disruption, discontinuity of uh, spinal cord, which leads to complete spinal cord injury. And in, um, in other cases where there is incomplete, meaning there is still some uh, neurons, some uh, axons are still intact uh, below the level of lesion. So uh, two terminology that's used to, uh, uh, to explain or to in refer to a clinical feature of spinal cord injury, that is paraplegia and tetraplegia. The word, the term tetraplegia is often specifically used uh, when it, in spinal cord injury, it, it, it just to refer to involvement of trunk in addition to uh, 
upper limb, two upper limb, and two lower limb, right? And quadriplegia is also sort of used, right? So in incomplete, you can see the incomplete injury, there is no function below the level of lesion. That's as simple as it. If you have a particular level below that, there is no function, no motor function, no sensory function, no autonomous function, and so on. But in incomplete injury, there are some functions are left. It may be some motor function is uh, uh, still left or some amount of motor function, sensory function is there. Uh, that would be the incomplete uh, lesion, right? There are many types of uh, incomplete lesions out there. The, the very well-known uh, incomplete lesion, the syndromes are anterior cord syndrome, brown cord syndrome, and the central cord syndrome. Basically, it depends on which part of the, which region of spinal cord is affected. If the anterior part of spinal cord is affected, it's called anterior, it produces typical features that are predominantly motor symptoms because the anterior part of spinal cord has uh, mostly motor fibers, anterior horn cells, and you have corticospinal tract and so on, and both in lateral uh, horn and uh, gray matter. Posterior horn, the other way around where it's predominantly sensory involvement that is there. And in central cord syndrome, you have a mixture of it, uh, but, you uh, but the, uh, the more laterally located fibers are often uh, spared. So you have a typical symptom uh, that appears in spinal central cord syndrome. I encourage you to read this slide a little bit in depth because I'm not going to really uh, uh, explain each and every uh, clinical feature because as I said, this is an overview of clinical feature. Brown secret syndrome, uh, it is popular, uh, especially when it comes to exams, uh, because it has certain typical features where in one side you have pain and temperature affected and the other side you have uh, proprioception is affected. And also it's, it sort of mimics uh, hemiplegia uh, in spinal cord injury. So it's very popular in textbooks, its features because of the characteristic feature it produces. But clinically, we rarely see brown secret syndrome because for a brown secret syndrome to be seen, you, you sort of need a hemisection of spinal, uh, spinal cord. That is one half of the spinal cord has to be affected, uh, which is uh, very rare. But in some, if in uh, surgical lesions or in a gunshot injury that just went into the central part of spinal cord, right, it is possible. Uh, the next would, uh, okay, we will see the next uh, uh, slides. Of what we are going to look at here is putting everything uh, uh, together, uh, a flow chart of how pathogenesis and clinical findings are related. Uh, in this, you can see you have uh, all these different uh, cord syndromes, including posterior cord syndrome, just missing in the previous slide, and the conus medullaris syndrome too. And you have one more cord iguana syndrome, which is basically a, a, low, a lower motor neuron syndrome. So I encourage you to uh, pause the slide and have a deeper look at these uh, flow chart so that you will have a better understanding of it. This concludes uh, part one of uh, spinal cord injury rehabilitation. Uh, it's, like it's just a brief overview of pathogenesis and clinical features. Uh, to summarize, uh, spinal cord injury, especially traumatic spinal cord injury is very common among young adult group and uh, common causes of traffic, traffic uh, injuries, a traffic accident and fall from the height. And uh, the pathogenesis, the secondary events are, uh, have a significant role. So we need to understand second event that you have the inflammatory responses following uh, a, any uh, trauma. And the secondary injuries pretty much uh, to a greater extent, it's minimized, you can minimize it and it's also preventable. So that's why the secondary injuries are uh, significant. And the clinical features, the primarily when we look at a spinal cord injury, we got to see whether it's complete or incomplete. And uh, incomplete injury, you have different syndromes out there. That is anterior cord syndrome, posterior cord syndrome, brown secret syndrome, conus medullaris syndrome, and cord iguana syndrome. So this fundamental understanding, uh, clinical feature understanding is necessary uh, as a background for us when we manage spinal cord injury. 
in the next part uh, i will be discussing about uh, examination of uh, patients with spinal cord injury